Um, and since, unfortunately, Ian Gay can't make it up from Birmingham, I've slightly expanded the topic of my talk. My original remit was to look at resection and transplantation for liver metastases. I thought I'd take a little bit broader since we have a few more minutes of time. Um, but basically, as we've said, we're dealing with actually a very common condition. The incidence is rare. I tell the patients when they come and see me to get an idea of incidence. If you put a sellout game at Anfield here in Liverpool and a sellout game at Goodison, you might find one person in between the two stadiums who've got this condition. But the vast majority actually do very well, and they live for a very long time. Um, so I wanted to cover a number of other controversies. And firstly, the question of the patient who presents in stage four and whether or not we should be taking out the primary tumor for those patients, whether they're symptomatic or asymptomatic. Go on to that to talk about liver metastases and whether resection has a role, and if so, for whom? Is there a role for ablation therapy? And lastly, the question of liver transplantation, which Juan touched on very briefly, and I'm going to come back to later on. Now, first of all, the question of dealing with the primary tumor in a patient who presents with incurable metastatic disease. This is a difficult question. Um, often these patients have mild symptoms. We're talking predominantly about mid-gut carcinoids. We might also be talking about the pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors, but the big problem is the small one to two centimeter mid-gut carcinoid, but liver infiltration involving all segments. And there aren't that many data out there. Now these are data from Uppsala, the biggest single center experience in Europe. Um, this guy, these guys have been looking at this now for nearly 50 years. And essentially what they've done, retrospectively from their prospective database, is looked at, in stage four disease, survival in the solid circles where the primary tumor wasn't resected, and in the open circles for those where the primary tumor was resected. Now, this is a complete fruit salad interpretation of apples, oranges, and pears, and you get a bit of a fruit salad. But there does appear to be a trend towards benefit, overall survival benefit, for these patients. And this is follow up up to 25 years if the patients un underwent a primary tumor resection. Now, there are other caveats to that. The question of whether or not, in some cases, the primary tumor is so infiltrated with desmoplasia that it's not resectable, or the patient's fitness to undergo surgery. About three or four years ago, five of the biggest centers in the country decided to pool our data under UKINETS, the United Kingdom and Ireland Neuroendocrine Tumor Society, um, to look at our own outcomes in our five centres. This was Royal Free in London, the Liverpool Group, the King's Group in London, working with Basingstoke, and the Belfast Group. And we ended up with 360 patients with mid-gut carcinoid tumours who had liver metastases were in stage four. And the fundamental question really was, what was the role of surgery in the management of their primary tumour if they were presenting with incurable disease? So we looked at correlation of sites of metastases and surgical management. Within that group of patients, 209 patients actually had their primary tumor resected. 81 were not resected. 12 had attempted resections, but as those of you who have experience of this condition, frequently there's very intense desmoplasia in the mesentery, varices because of the desmoplasia, and technically it's just too dangerous to resect, and those patients had either a bypass, 12 of them, or an open and close, a failure, and 17, those are 17 patients. And these are the survival data. Now, the 210 in green who were resectable, remember these patients have incurable disease, clearly do better than those who were either not resected, bypassed, or had a failed resection. Now, again, it's difficult to interpret this, but there appears to be a trend towards better outcome if you can resect. The worry is, in these patients, is that you don't resect them when you know where the prime is there, and they then obstruct on a Friday night and get admitted to a medium-sized district general hospital where the locum surgical registrar and the locum anesthetist do the laparotomy on the Saturday night, having never seen this condition before in their lives. Would those patients be far better to have a cold light of day elective procedure done by somebody who's experienced, and more importantly, an anaesthetist who is experienced in managing patients during surgery for carcinoid syndrome um, in the cold light of day. And I do think we should be pushing to have a trial now, and I'll come back to this at the end, for these very patients. Unfortunately, there is not a great deal of enthusiasm in the neuroendocrine community for this. We proposed this three years ago, 
at the ENETS meeting, the European Neuroendocrine Tumor Society meeting in Berlin, and really didn't get much enthusiasm at all for recruitment into a trial. Maybe this should be a discussion point at the end. Turning to liver metastases, what are our objectives? Well, ideally, and I'm saying this doing from my day job, to try and cure people. However, that's only appropriate for a small minority. Does intervention in the liver, be it surgery or resection or, um, or an embolization, prolonged survival? Are we going to improve symptom control and quality of life? Clearly, there is a health economics issue here because one's already touched on this. The drugs we're talking about here are extremely expensive, and these patients live for a very long time. And what quality of life will they get either without treatment or with treatment or intervention? Now, when it comes to resection, the rules are fairly clear. We've got most of the rules now from the use of surgery for liver metastases of colorectal cancer. And quite clearly in this situation, where you've got a small solitary metastasis on the edge of the liver, which can easily be resectable, then you would go to surgery as your, as your treatment of choice. We could also um, consider the question of resection of the primary tumor at the same time. I have one lady here in Liverpool, purely by anecdote, who I resected 10 primaries and seven liver metastases, carcinoid, at the same operation 12 years ago, who has since remained disease-free ever since. So we can do this as a combined procedure. Ideally, we want to achieve our zero in the liver with a future remnant liver of about 30% that appears disease-free at the time of surgery. And that kind of surgery, we believe, will confer the chance of cure on these patients and certainly the chance of long-term survival. But, as we know from colorectal cancer, only about 20% of patients with metastatic carcinoid tumor meet these criteria. Now, again, going back to the Ukinet survey, the one I've just shown you, we published three years ago, um, we looked at the, the patients we discussed, and of those patients, 50 ended up having a liver resection. 310 didn't have a liver resection, and clearly the curves separate early and they continue to separate. So this would appear that certainly out at 20 years, we've got long-term long survivors following liver resection. Interestingly, we still have 20-year survivors amongst those patients who don't have a liver resection. But the survival benefit appears to be for those who can undergo liver resection. These are my own data from here in Liverpool, from all the patients sent in to us with mid-gut carcinoid. Um, and we stratified them in basically into three groups. The vast majority in the blue curve were basically no resection of the primary um, and basically with, with metastatic disease. In the silver or gray curve, those who had our zero resection of the primary and their liver metastasis, so 33 patients who had apparently curative resection of primary mid-gut carcinoid and liver metastases. And then in the green curve, our zero resection of the primary, which is apparently curative at that stage. Now, what, is a, what appears to be the case when we look at these curves is that the green and silver curves are really the same. And we see this in colorectal cancer. The survival curve at five years for patients after resection of liver metastases of colorectal cancer is identical to those who undergo resection of the primary for a stage three primary tumor. So what that probably tells you is that the staging system is wrong. We should probably put all patients with metastatic disease in stage three if that metastatic disease is resectable. Because what's the difference between a lymph node metastasis that's resectable and a liver metastasis that's resectable? And maybe we should use stage four for patients who are not candidates for surgical resection. So if it would appear that in our series, in the Ukinet series and other data that are coming through, if you can resect the liver metastases, those patients certainly have long-term survival benefit and the chance of cure. What about cytoreductive surgery? Now, we don't do this for colorectal cancer. We don't do R2 debulking in colorectal cancer surgically. There are some data I'm going to show you very shortly for ablation therapy and the possible survival benefit. But it may be contributory to controlling symptoms. Remember, these patients' quality of life is largely affected by their symptoms. And interestingly, for instance, in carcinoid, the thing that kills carcinoid patients is carcinoid heart disease and the long-term effect on the heart of, of suffering from carcinoid syndrome. So if you can take away the engine that drives the carcinoid syndrome, you may be conferring a survival benefit on them in terms of slowing down the rate of carcinoid heart disease and its effect on the heart valves. There's also the question of health economics. One touched on this by the cost of these drugs. And would this be cheaper 
if we can debulk these patients to get symptom control, improve quality of life, and can we improve on the health economics, particularly in the present time. However, the data are very limited. They're small series, single center series, small numbers. We presented these data to Orgis when we met in Oxford uh, two, what, a year and a half ago now. And this was our experience at that time. 340 patients coming to us in our joint multidisciplinary team across the city. And 190 had stage three and were apparently cured. But 150 were in stage four with apparently incurable disease. And we stratified those into two separate groups. Those who went on to medical management, and this was very complex, it could simply be somatostatin analog therapy, either LAR or lanreotide, targeted nuclear therapy, of which we've got one of the largest experiences in the country, using initially uh, MIBG with I131, then more recently with yttrium-90, octretide, uh, and then dototoc, and most recently using lutetium. Um, or were they candidates for surgery? Now, of those with liver limited disease, 14 went on to a cur potentially curative resection, R0 in the liver. However, 19 had a debulking operation, either R1 or R2. So of these 33 resections, operative mortality was zero, and these are quite complex patients. Remember, they are getting into stages of early heart disease as well. Um, um, by the Clavian-Dindo classification of complications, 15% had grade three or greater complications within 30 days, wound infections, chest infections, bile leaks. But we look at survival, the orange curve at the bottom are our so-called medical patients. The cream curve at the top are those in who underwent R0, potentially curative resection, and the yellow curve are those with a cytoreductive surgery. Now, both the surgical candidates actually do quite well for the first three or four years. And then we start to see the debulking patients drop off their perches um, and start to join the curve below. However, they stay separate from the curve, those who undergo the recept curative resection. Now remember, the numbers are small. Statistics on this kind of patients are really not that relevant in terms of trying to produce a p-value. It's just a trend that we're looking for at the moment. However, we did look at quality of life, and one of the research nurses in our group has done her MSc on quality of life in neuroendocrine patients and works on the ORTC quality of life group. And we found that the patients who came to surgery had complete resolution of symptoms in over 90%, and that included coming off all medication and return to normal quality of life. However, the duration of that in the cytoreductive of the R2 group was only 21 months, but in the curative group, it was nearly four years. So those patients were off other medication if you had a curative resection up to four years before new symptoms began to recur as disease recurred. So do the health economics stack up? Well, we've already said this is a low incidence disease but a very high prevalence disease, the second commonest gastrointestinal tumor by prevalence. And a lot of patients live a long time now, particularly if you manage their heart disease preemptively and stop them dying of heart disease. We can look at tumor ablations, and I'll show you some data of that in a second. Basically, it comes to about 3,000 pounds of treatment. We can look at liver tumor resections. These cost about 10,000 pounds on the current tariff. Or we can look at long-term somatostatin analog treatment, which depends on the dose you use and the scheduling you're using in terms of frequency, whether it's two week, three week, or four week, can be between 10 and 15,000 a year, or in some cases, a lot more. And then we looked at the question of surgery and the cost per quality of life year gained um, compared to that for medical management. Well, the bottom line is that for these patients, the surgery across on the right-hand side for the time of quality of life year gain comes out at £2,340 per quality of life adjusted year. For the medical management, it is the same price year on year on year. So it's coming in at over £12,000. So it would appear on health economics grounds that if you can reset for cure and in the central column debulk, you might get a health economics advantage for these patients and the added quality of life benefit of not having to be injected every two, three, or four weeks with what is actually a very large and very painful injection. Has ablation got a role? Well, the data are anecdotal at best. Um, really very little quality of life data for these particular patients. Never been demonstrated in a prospective randomized controlled trial. 
The data we're just about to publish from the URTC clock trial looking at non-resectable but ablatable correct liver metastases might shed some light on this. The trial was designed about 12 years ago and it's just coming to publication and of oncology in the next month or so. And this was 105 patients randomized to either chemotherapy alone with Folfox-4 systemically or chemotherapy Folfox-4 plus ablation. Our primary endpoint was to try and improve at the time 15-month overall survival in chemotherapy to 30 months with ablation. And what did we find at 30 months, but both curves were identical. And the reason was this was designed 12 or 13 years ago. It never anticipated multiple lines of chemotherapy being introduced and all sorts of other advantages of multidisciplinary management. But we do, however, see it as the curves get past four or five years that the blue curve of the radiofrequency arm appears to be separating from the red curve of chemotherapy alone suggesting that there may be a survival benefit for ablation in metastatic colorectal cancer. And bearing in mind that the same rules have applied to resection of carcinoid metastases have applied to colorectal cancer, these might be translatable across to using ablation therapy for these patients. Now, the final question, that of transplantation versus resection. Clearly, these patients on the right-hand side with disease in every anatomical segment of the liver are not candidates for resection, and with the extensive tumour burden, not candidates for ablation. There have been, over the last 20 or even 25 years now, anecdotal reports of using liver transplantation as an alternative for these patients because, by and large, their disease is confined to the liver and nowhere else if the primary is resected. These anecdotes basically have talked about one-year survivals after liver transplantation of 52%, and some series have reported even as high as 69% five-year survival. However, transplant-related deaths are not uncommon. And the literature is very limited, only 250 cases, and one's already shown you this one, who took himself off to Memphis and bought himself a house in the grounds of the hospital, had his liver transplant five years ago, and sadly passed away last year. So really, did Steve Jobs get any benefit from his liver transplantation? Well, the, probably the best of the least reliable data there are is this French multi-center retrospective analysis. And this comes out to 85 patients from a number of centers across France. Remember, there are many more liver transplant centers in France than there are in the United Kingdom. And essentially, what they've done is taken these small numbers of patients, anecdotal case series, and just to see what actually happened. The operative mortality for these patients is 14% compared to the operative mortality of liver transplantation for parenchymal liver disease, which is running at about 3 to 4% at the moment. So really, there's three times as many dying from the transplant in this group because they have other problems related to their neuroendocrine tumors. If we look at the overall survival in this group of patients for the 85 in the French series, it's barely half at five years of which only one in five were disease-free at five years. The disease recurred. So overall, this doesn't look very good. And this is an operation that costs in excess of £100,000. They were able to look at various risk factors that predicted poorer outcome. And clearly, if you were eviscerated and had a total gut transplant, that was a bad thing. If it was pancreatic primary tumor compared to mid-gut carcinoids, they did worse. And if you had palpable hepatomegaly and your liver was down in your groins, that was also bad news too. And these were then converted into a risk factor and a scoring factor. And basically, if you had none of these risk factors, your five-year survival was 76% or three out of four. If you had two of these factors, you did not do well. Your chance of being alive in five years' time was barely 10% or not much better. So there is some insight into who or who we should not be transplanting. But does that make a difference overall compared to the other treatments? Well, let's go back to my data. These are my personal series. These are what I get here in Liverpool. And as I say, I want to look at this time not at the green and the silver curves, those patients who were surgically resectable, be it for primary or primary metastases, but the blue curve, the ones we manage medically. And let's put in the French transplant series. And are these essentially the same curves? To me, I don't see a difference in those curves at five years. That the medical management of these patients is probably as good as transplantation, probably a little bit cheaper too. So, just to summarize, surgery 
for liver neuroendocrine metastasis does offer a chance of cure to a small minority of patients. And it is relatively safe. Um, possibly justifiable on health economics ground, particularly looking at the cost of long-term medical management and the quality of life issues. But there are still questions we need to address. The question of resection of the primary tumor in the presence of inoperable liver metastases, the role of tumor ablation as an alternate to resection, the role of liver transplantation, because although in this country it, you would not be eligible for transplant at the present time with liver neuroendocrine metastases, you'd be way, way down the scoring and way down the waiting list. There are other places around the world quite clearly will quite happily transplant you if you can get a match from an execution in China or something that will match you against your particular liver tissue type. So future trials, possibly resection versus observation for asymptomatic primary tumor in stage four. Should we run a trial of R2 debulking against medical management with health economics being the primary endpoint alongside quality of life being a very high secondary endpoint. So these are things we need to think about. And as I said in with Juan Valle's talk, the question of adjuvant studies. We now have what look very interesting agents, which we could now be considering in the adjuvant setting for the management of patients after potentially curative resection of the primary tumor. Thank you very much, and I'd be very happy to take questions.